And then when I got into the start with the martial arts, there was no room for that. There was no, you know, why can't I do this? I could do that. I did everything. And then I excelled at it. Hello there, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 736, with today's guest, Master Angelo Matei. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If that means something to you, if you are a traditional martial artist and you want your efforts and your lifestyle to be supported, well, you should check out whistlekick.com. What are you going to find over there? You're going to find links and pages to all of the projects that we're involved in. There's a whole bunch of stuff and it's a growing list. Seriously, if you have not been to whistlekick.com in the last few months, you are missing out on new things that we're rolling out. One of the things that's been there from day one, but it changes constantly, is our store. The store at whistlekick.com has everything from stuff you might expect, shirts and hats and such, to training apparel, to training gear, to training programs, as well as super cool, fun, different stuff that you might not imagine. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to save 15% on the stuff over there. So go check it out. You should also check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you an episode, two episodes rather, each and every week, and they all get their own pages over there. And that's where we put the transcripts and the links from the stuff that we talk about and photos and videos that the guests send us. If you're just used to checking out the show notes in your podcast app, you are missing out. So please check out that website as well. And why do we do all of this? Well, we're looking to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world because we believe that martial artists overall are better people and that with training, we become better versions of ourselves. If you want to support us in our mission, you got lots of things you can do to help out. You could buy something from the store. You could tell people about this show, or maybe even contribute to our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month, and there are tiers that go up from there. At each level, we give you back incredible value. And how are we gauging that value exchange? The number of people who come in and don't leave. Almost everybody who comes in does not leave. And it's great to watch that community grow. We have a bunch of exclusive stuff that happens over at the Patreon, and you can Find out more about that by visiting that website. But if you want the whole list, all the things you can do to support Whistlekick, go to the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. If you're family, you've probably already done this. If you're new to the family, check it out. You won't be sorry. I had a great conversation with Angelo, and you're going to love it. At least, I hope you do, because I had a great time talking to him. And I'm not even going to set this one up for you. We're just going to go into it right Good morning. How are you? Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for doing this. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm uh, actually was actually taken back a little bit when uh, I received the email. Cool. So that means we're doing something right if you're if you feel that way. So go us. Oh, all right. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, before I forget, how do I say your last name? Matei. Okay. Is that's it's easy it's, enough? Yeah. Matei. That is easy. It's just the. The common, you know, American pronunciation. There we go. All right. Cool. Well, uh, we have a decision at this point. We can just we can just go, or we can talk about what we're going to do. It's up to you. You're, if you're comfortable. Let's let's just go. Okay. I, I go. like it when we just roll. So okay, we'll roll. We're rolling. We're rolling. All all that stuff's going to be in there. It's the most authentic behind the scenes. People they're like, man, it's, Jeremy's even fixing the lighting in. Absolutely. <laughs> because that the, the world is imperfect right like it, it's, it's sloppy it's messy I, I was um unscripted it is it's unscripted yes we we do a morning show and one of the things that came up in the morning show this morning and that I'll, I'll i'm curious of, of your thoughts on this we we oftentimes like to justify things with the sheer numbers of people that do this or that or the other Oh, well, most people do this, so it must be right or, or better. But if Five. we look at martial arts and martial artists, most martial artists haven't been doing martial arts for very long. So most martial artists actually, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to say they suck, not in a judgmental way, but just be out of right. an experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's almost like the, it's some of the conversations that I have with other other martial artists that started in the 80s or 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, I started in the 90s, um, so I, I kind of started to get into the tail end of their modus operandi and what yeah. the martial arts were for them, <clears throat> which are mostly adults. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then you get into the, then the kids martial arts started, you know, 80s and 90s as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting concept because, uh, you know, and it, it's very, it has to come from a, a, a certain specific perspective. Everyone has their own perspective on what it is. And, yeah. and I believe that there's value everywhere. So uh, at least that's my approach to, the martial arts there's value in all of it i'll never knock a style i'll never knock a stylist Same. um i don't particularly like heavy ego or self-righteousness and you know the stuff that that most of us don't like to deal with on a regular basis but i don't think anybody likes it no right I, it's, I it's, it's abrasive yeah and, yeah, and it, especially it, when you're um you know, we are trying to be open and open-minded. Um, and when you, when you, when you hit that door, <laughs> you, you know, it, you, you hit the door, you, you basically hit the door and then you're like, okay, it's a door. So, um, <laughs> but it is an interesting concept that everyone's doing it this way. So that's the way it's happening. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> and, and I think for a lot of us in the martial arts, uh, and I certainly include myself in that group when everybody's doing something a certain way, I want to go the other way and see what's mm -hmm. going on over there because yeah. I'm either going to reinforce, this is why so many people do this, or I'm potentially going to find something that people aren't willing to explore. Right. right. Like, like all, you know, as you said, and I, and I certainly agree, all styles have value. All methodologies have value. They may not be equally value valuable in all situations, right. but it comes back to your why. Why do you do? Why do you train? Mm -hmm. Etc. Et but I may find something as I'm hunting around in this discarded pile of techniques and go, oh, I kind of like the way that goes. It's completely counter to what I was taught or what I thought made sense. And maybe I, all I find is, you know what? I'm going to keep doing the way I did it. Yeah. Yeah, I love the explore the, the the exploration. My whole martial mm. arts career has been well, career if you want to call it a career, but my path has been, um, you know, unplanned, unscripted, um, uh, serendipitous, uh, and you know, uh, it, I just wound up studying the styles that I did because mm. of my life situation. You know, I never had to say, "Well, I want to learn." That. Only only one style that I really want to learn that I actually seeked out. And, and learned and and um and i did that for a couple of years and then i took some time off from that because of injuries sure. and then i went back to it again later and yeah what what was that that you saw that was uh, wing chun kung fu okay and why why did you well uh, so i started off differently with, like, i started off yeah. as a taekwondo stylist you know okay. i was in the middle of uh it was in my early 20s my mid yeah 23 24 yeah. <clears throat> excuse me and i was going through a really rough time in my life mm -hmm. and uh my, my younger brother was actually studying with a friend of his privately. Mm -hmm. He said, Oh, you gotta, you gotta do this, man. You gotta, you gotta come and try this, you know? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. You know, I said, okay, fine. So I showed up and I was hooked in instantly. Like why? first day. What, what was it? You know why? Because it, it focused, I, I, I was focusing on me. I was mm -hmm. focusing on my, it was just my personal focus. It was just me and myself and my reflection in the mirror. And, not that, and I that, had no, ex I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. So I had no control mechanisms. I couldn't, I didn't have a say, I didn't have an opinion. I didn't have any uh, database of, of, uh, of knowledge that I can compare it to. It's not right. It's wrong. I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm just like, yes, sir. Like, that was it. Do that. Yes, sir. And then he would say, that's fine. I would throw kicks. He'd say, that's fine. No, that's good. Good job. Nothing, nothing like that. That's fine. So I'm like, fine, I just keep doing this. He's like, yeah, okay, I could do this. I just kept going. And I, it, it, was, it, the, the, it was a positive focus on me. Instead mm -hmm. of the time in my life, it was a negative focus on me. Yeah, there, there's a bit I, of an unspoken there. I mean, you're hinting at it now that there's some contrast between that experience, you know, focus on you. No, you didn't use this word, but I'm going to. No self-judgment about what you were doing. You just mm -hmm. had to show up and do what you were told and put in some effort. 
So exactly. what was what was going on around that time outside of any training that created that contrast? Well, I was in, in a victim paradigm. You know, mm-hmm. something something happened in my relationship. I couldn't believe it happened to me. I was a nice guy. I'm honest. I'm you know I followed. I'm a rule follower. I did all the right things, and then you know you experience betrayal, and it flips your world upside down. So at the time I was just sitting there wallowing in my own self pity. Why is this happening to me? I couldn't figure out what's wrong with me. All that kind of negative self talk. And then when I got into the start with the martial arts, there was no room for that. There was no, you know, why can't I do this? I could do that. I did everything. And then I excelled at it. And I'm the kind of person that excels very quickly at things. I learn things very quickly. I, I understand the mechanics of movement and things like that. Um, I've done many things in my life. I'm a jack of all trades. I'm a, uh, you know, I, I get good at things very, very quickly. So I got good very, very quickly. And it was, it was like, I was like a downhill train from there. I just, just, I just wanted more. I just became really, really hungry. I wanted to know more. And, um, and you've always so been I, like that, that, that yeah, kind of I'm passionate, always, immersive personality. Yes. Yeah. I got, well, binge, you know, people call it, you know, you binge on things. So it's like, yeah, yeah. I do. I, I, I binge until I'm satiated and then I move on. I'm a multipod or what's the new term? Multi-potential. I think they, that's the new term. For that. Prior to this exploration of Taekwondo, were there physical pursuits that you, you delved into that we might be able to see hints of what was to come? Um, sports, sports, gymnastics, yeah, yeah, football in high school, the soccer with friends. I grew up playing soccer. You know, my mm-hmm. father was an immigrant from Italy, and so he would put us all in the van when we were kids, and we put a soccer ball back there, and mm-hmm. we'd all bounce around the back of the van. <laughs> this is before seats, you know, were in a van. Right, and I remember that human cargo, you know. Yeah. And we would just—he would just drive us down to the park, and we just play soccer. So, you know, we played soccer, and it was just more of a social thing than than a physical, a physical thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't realize it at the time. It was actually after the martial arts that I really start to realize where some of my um, you know, my, my propensity to understanding patterns and learning movement and habits and, and, and observing those things from a, from a, a broader perspective. Um, before that, it was just, you know, social and, um, you know, just trying to, you know, have as much fun as I could. But Sure. Yeah. Did you, you, you mentioned your father was an immigrant and I, I, I've found from conversations with past guests that first generations in America, parents tend to have some pretty strong opinions on what their kids are doing. You know, I came to this country for this reason. Mm -hmm. You should be doing ABC, X, Y, Z. If you're not quite often, not in every case, but quite often, you know, you're wasting what I've done. Was there a strong opinion on your training? I think that fear is always there. Uh, But, you know, fear is a funny thing. You know, Mm -hmm. they, 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 you know, you come into this country, not speaking the language, you're young. Um, there's a lot of fear. So a lot of, a lot of their, um, behavior and their motives are uh, survival based, mm-hmm. you know? So, and, and what worked for them isn't necessary for you as the first generation, cause you, I was born here. So I'm an American and, um, I didn't have the same trials and tribulations they did. I didn't have the same challenges they did. Um, so that, that mentality of survival doesn't, isn't, isn't beneficial for me. You know, so you grow it's it's, it's, a, it's a different world you know but you, you still grow within the paradigm of fear you know yeah. and you start to recognize how that impacts your decision making how it impacts you know your own expectations of yourself you know and i'll tell you what it, it kept me out of trouble you know that the strictness that i grew up with kept me out of trouble kept me from doing stupid permanent mm. You know, we did stupid stuff as kids, but nothing stupid permanent. And that's what I tell my kids. You can do stupid stuff, but nothing stupid permanent. You know, it's a good line so, to draw. That, 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 I, I like the way you're articulating that. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. you know, so, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. And there is, there's expectations they have for us. And I don't even know if those expectations were solid. You know, I think they were just, you know, there's always the expectation you want your kids to be better off than you. Mm. No. But if you can't get out of your own space, then you, you won't recognize it when you see it. You know, so that becomes that becomes problematic. So, so you're 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 all in with Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. You're digging it. At some point, there there's some 
piece that's worth mentioning? You know, what's what's what's, oh, what's well, the next yeah. uh, point on the timeline <clears throat> that we should talk Interesting about? Interesting path, you know. I, I, I yeah. keep, you know, so for two years I studied Taekwondo under one gentleman. Uh, he, was, he was teaching privately at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. He was a, a medical student. Yeah, uh, he was with the he. I think he trained with the American Taekwondo uh, Association (ATA). Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now we just trained with him. We just showed up twice a week and, you know, three times a week, sometimes and one, you know, every once in a while on a weekend and trained with him. But then he had to do his residency. So he left after two and a half years. He had to move. Mm-hmm. So when we find my brother and I and our friend, we find ourselves without a teacher. So we're like, All right, what happens? Well, a few months later, my brother's friend came back from Korea. He was stationed in the U.S. military. He was captain of the U.S. karate team. He was the only American on the team. He fought, you know, all over. Asia, you know, in the Philippines, every day flew him everywhere to, to, to compete. Um, Kuki Wan style, stylist, uh, the mm-hmm. Taekwondo. And he came back and he's like, let's train. So we started training under him. And that was like some of the hardest training I've ever experienced. But, you know, I don't, I didn't see it as difficult at the time. I just felt this is challenging and, and um, very rewarding. You know, we would come out of there sore like I've never been sore. You know, I mean, looking, I would literally t- look down at my feet and that was too much of a stretch for my hamstrings. We couldn't walk. Ooh, so it was so that, much, that's some intense training. For so sure. much kicking. And we got, you know, we would leave there. Like, when are we going to do this again? You know, it was that kind of uh, um, training. It just made it fun. And uh, so I got, you know, four and a half years later, you know, I got my black belt from him. But in the interim, his life changes a little bit. So he can't teach as much. I had to keep training. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm a junkie now. So I, I, I have to find something. So I meet this guy haphazardly. You know, we're just kind of hanging out. I meet this guy who's a fucking now and sure and rue stylist. He's an instructor. And mm-hmm. he says, come to my house. We're trained down my basement. So, all right. So I show up. And there's a bunch of people down there. Can, can, can I just interrupt for a moment and say that yes. I think martial arts is the only time you can invite someone to your basement <laughs> and, they, and they assume the best, right? If I yeah. invited you... To, if you didn't know I was a martial artist and I say, come over, we'll go down in my basement, you would assume the worst. But if I say, come over, we'll go down in my basement and train, or that's where my mats are, or that's where the heavy bags yeah. are. For some reason, we all automatically assume, oh, great. Yeah, you have like a mattress wrapped around a lolly column. You're like, we're exactly. going to kick the mattress, right? <laughs> exactly. And that's what it was. It was, his, it was an unfinished basement. It was just a big open space. And uh, so I started training in Okinawa and Shoren Room. And I'll tell you, my hands got good because, mm-hmm. you know, nothing makes your hands better than getting hit in the face repeatedly. You know, when you start getting punched from a close distance and, and, yeah. and I didn't like it at first, but then, you know, I knew something happened when I actually started to enjoy it. Um, then I really started to get good with the hands. And so, so the, the, the path, I had no idea what the path was going to be. I just, you know, just kind of followed what was in front of me, you know, it showed up mm-hmm. for me. Um, so I've trained in Okinawa and Shoren Ru, then I got my black belt in Taekwondo, and I kept training in Okinawa and Shoren Ru until, until he blew his shoulder out and had to have surgery, and he couldn't teach anything. So I mean, here I am. Okay. Now, I was an auto mechanic at the time. I hurt my back, so I couldn't train anymore. Like, I, mm. I had leg uh, neuropathy in my leg. It was, I mean, it was a bad herniation. Yeah. And I was I was really bummed out. I was like, I got to train. I have to do something. I can't not. I can't just lay around. I can't. You're do this. you're essentially you you use the term junkie before. You're essentially addicted. Yeah. To training. I, at this I point. was I was a karate head. I mean, I just wanted to learn, and mm-hmm. I really wasn't didn't really care. I wasn't affixed to any particular style. I wasn't loyal to any particular style. I just wanted to learn about the martial arts and, and different philosophies. And uh, so I started on my own. Started studying Tai Chi because that was the only thing I could do mm-hmm. was stand up straight. And new arm movements. And so I did that for years. And then finally hooked up with an instructor who, you know, they make the little changes. And at this point, I was so aware of my body that um, any little change they made, I felt immediately. So I was like, this is the one, this is awesome. Internal versus external martial arts. And then in that period of time, I started studying Wing Chun Kung Fu because I wanted to, I wanted to learn that, that philosophy. And I, I, I assume your back was getting better. Yeah, they didn't do any kicks above the waist. I was like, I could do that, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't kick over my head anymore. Uh, so I kind of like that philosophy, straight up, solid structure, uh, spine straight. I was like, that's perfect for me. You know, it's, it's very similar in terms of structure with Tai Chi and becoming aware of upper body, lower body, that kind of thing. Um, 
And then that school closed at some point. So, you know, it seems like every style that I got into at some point would end. And then I found myself kind of looking around like, you know, hungry for more. What's next? I had no idea what would be next. And then things would progress there. Meet up with a, a Tai Chi instructor who also taught Bagua, learned Bagua and that kind of stuff and weapons training. And I would do seminars at whatever I can get a hold of. And I still love to do seminars. I still love to learn. Um, and then at one point I got into involved with an outfit, um, it was a franchise opportunity for me. I was like, I wanted to get into a business and I didn't even think of the martial arts business. So I got into that and then that changed and turned over. And then I hooked up with my instructor and he unfortunately passed away last year. So I like, I find myself like every time I get a teacher that I'm with, something happens and, and I'm just like, well, that's just my path. It's just the way you know, yeah. I'm a firm believer in how you, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. And it just seems to show up that way for me. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm curious because there's, um, I mean, we, we can certainly easily articulate the, the downside of being with someone and, and only getting them for a few years, right? Like you're not mm-hmm. going as far or as deep. You're certainly not. Uh, exhausting what they have to offer you but at the right. same time it forces you to look elsewhere you know and it, it's not that you necessarily yeah. had to go to completely different martial arts but at the very least you're forced into having a different instructor if you're going to remain mm-hmm. one of the subjects that comes up on on the show in our conversations from time to time is the notion of mastery versus diversity Mm. And you, you almost didn't have a choice. You were thrown into diversity. Mm-hmm. And now that you've been training a while, and you, if you look back on those early years where it's, you know, this, this cadence of a few years here and there with different instructors, how do you look at that? Do you see that in a positive light? Do you wish it had gone differently? Well, I, I certainly don't wish it had gone differently. I, I really have come to appreciate my path. There's something to say about having, you know, having a goal. So if you have a goal and you want to become a master at a certain style, um, there's something to say for that because it, it, it takes a lot of dedication and you're going to, you're going to experience teachers coming and going. If you're in a, in a school and they have a second down teacher and next thing you know, they're off to college or they get a job and they got to move or they get married or life happens to people. Um, if you have, the, if you're lucky enough to have the grand master at your location, if it's one of those the outfits where the grandmaster is close by and you could train under them, then, you know, it's, it's a good thing. You're lucky to have that, that lengthy path and you could master that one style and you're a single stylist. And that's, and that's a beautiful thing. Cause you know, you've, you've mastered it, you know, you've gotten to a, to a mastery a sense of mastery. Um, but I think everybody's so different, you know, um, I think when you, when I started off, I had no idea, like I had no idea that I was going to study multiple styles. I was like, I love this. I'm going to keep doing this. Um, and it just so happens that, you know, it happened the way it was. Now, if I was in a school with a, with organi- with a federation and an organization where the organization and the federation would bring people in to cover or to continue, that's a different environment, right? And you could keep going to that school and keep going and, and learn that way. Um, I, that wasn't my path. That wasn't, that wasn't what showed up for me. Um, only sense of math, the only mastery I have now is I'm a master level in Tang Sudo and I've been over 12 years now. I've been teaching it and, and, um, you know, I have my mastery under, under the late, you know, grandmaster, uh, Lewis Marvel. Um, and you know, even that's like, the, uh, so that's a master, but I know there's so much more to learn. So there's, there's something to learn, um, as a person. You know, and as a stylist and as a martial artist, there's always going to be something to learn, whether you're focused in one direction and one style or whether you're, you know, dabbling, because I think you evolve, not, not so much the style evolves around you. You evolve within styles. You evolve within yourself. And even if you're not paying attention, I just say the kids are not paying attention. At some point, it's going to show up for them. And maybe it's not important to them now, but at some point it will. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, I don't, I don't regret, um, you know, the only, the only thing I have in the back of my mind is like, why do I keep losing teachers? You know, I don't want to get a next teacher because <laughs> you, I don't want anything out of them or to me, you know, I was like, yeah. I don't know what that's about, but, um, you know, I, I've had the, the, the privilege of studying under some really great people. Even even now, I study Yaido, 
as well. I'm part of Tiger Family Idaho Association under uh, Grandmaster S.L. Martin. And I love the guy. You know, he puts his hands on you and then you know. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I, I I appreciate when they when they put when they call me up for to 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 be the you know, I'm gonna demonstrate on you know they, they take come up here and I'm like all right good you know because I, I you know you you at this level you appreciate that kind of energy you appreciate Absolutely. that the subtlety in what they do and how powerful it is so the kids are like oh no he's gonna pick me no 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 he's gonna pick I want him to pick me you know uh, so yeah you just get a different level of appreciation at some point you know because it, 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 it's interesting. They're different on the uh, at the beginning, towards 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 the middle. They start to merge. You know, mm-hmm. you can see who borrowed what from where, and then you start to see how they evolve individually and separately as styles. But it all comes down to a lot of the same stuff. Your body only moves so many ways. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, what do you what do you want? That's you know? true. So it's an amazing it's an amazing holistic path to self mastery. That's how I look at it. How did you end up in Tung Sido? Well, the you, you said the only, would, the only, and I want to yeah. just remind the audience, you said the only martial art that you sought out was Wing Chun. Yes. That's so the somehow one this fell in your a, lap too. Yeah. I had a desire to learn Wing Chun. Like I wanted sure. to learn Wing Chun. I had a friend who studied it and we, we spoke about it and he said a few things and I was like, oh, that sounds really awesome. Like I would, you know, how do you, and then he would do certain things with his hands and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I, I had no concept of what was in his mind. And you, you can't, you can't conceptualize. You have, I had no point of reference for what he was doing. I only once you start to learn it, do you really start to understand what it is. And even the, to, to the, the length of which I studied, it is nothing compared to those who have been in it for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And I know that. I respect that. I, I really do. I'm humbled by the fact that I don't, I know I don't know a lot of stuff. Um, so that was the only style that I really, really uh, wanted to learn uh, because of the conversation that I had with a friend of mine. Um, but I got into Tang Sudo when I got involved with the, this franchise opportunity of, of you know getting into a, a martial arts school franchise mm-hmm. opportunity, and um, and it, it was nothing like I thought it would be. You know, you have these concepts of these schools. Oh, you know, they, they just run the kids through, and, and then I, but I watched what the looks on these kids' faces. And I, I looked at what the program could offer these kids, young kids. And I was blown away. I was really amazed at, at some of the, the value, as I was a little older, of course, I, the value of what this stuff teaches young kids mm. that the kids aren't going to get anywhere else. Right? There's stuff that you learn in the martial arts that you don't learn anywhere else. Right? So, uh, so I got into, and it was a Tang Sudo school. So I, can't, I went in with my first degree in Taekwondo, similar. Uh, you know, similar in technique, it's Korean style, you know, mm-hmm. one's the sport, one's the the, 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 the traditional style. And, um, you know, I just ate it up, but it was, you know, again, you know, when you're hungry, you eat, you know? So, yeah. uh, I just like, there was a lot to learn and there's a lot I needed to catch up on and to, in order to get to a certain uh, rank and to a certain position in order to be able to teach. Um, and then I had to learn their methodologies and things like that. And then I just, that was just what I was doing. I had so much time into it that that's, you know, I'm like, then I met my instructor nine years ago and uh, we clicked. We had a very similar mindset in, in, in martial arts, in training, in teaching, learning, that kind of thing that we just connected. And, uh, and the rest, they say, is history. You know, mm. That's why I find myself here, um, still teaching Tang Sudo. So 30 years in, Right, I'm doing that math right. Thirty-ish. Yeah, thirty about thirty years, thirty something years. Yeah, thirty plus years in, you're still going. Are you as passionate, less passionate, more passionate than you in your twenties about your training? It's interesting. That's a good question. My my passion is still there. My my body on the other hand at 56 <laughs> you know i'm scheduled for surgery on friday mm. for my knee i have meniscus nice. issue in my left knee they're gonna they're Just gonna hard. clean it up and then mm. i can hopefully get back to running and my other physical stuff that i do to stay in shape um and teaching and, and, and training as well uh but yeah so my passion is still there i still want to learn um but i find myself in a very similar situation that i've done all along and that is I don't have a teacher right now because my teacher, unfortunately, last year passed away. Mm -hmm. And 
So what I'm, who am I going to learn from? What am I going to learn? So I said, oh, I'm, uh, I'm going to keep teaching, but I'm, I'm going to do as much seminars. There's seminars. Up. There's people I want to work with. You know, there's people you read about. I'm like, oh, I want, I want to spend an after weekend with this guy, or I want to learn this system, or I want to learn this weapon, or I want to. So I, I'm still very much hungry for information and for knowledge. I still want to be taught. I still need my soul needs to be fed with new concepts and new information or extensions of what I believe I know or what I've come to understand. Um, so the passion is very much still there. Um, I've already, it, it gets kind of limited at this, at this point because, you know, COVID comes around and people aren't training outside or in their basements anymore. Or they're the little schools that was basically just barely, you know, getting, paying their bills and, and you're right. They, yep. they have to stop. Now they're gone. So all the people that all these people that I told you that I mentioned that I wanted to go train with for a weekend here, they don't do it anymore. They're just starting to get back in, in, into it because things are opening up again. So it's, you know, so it's just, and so it goes back to, you know, I go back to the basics. I just, I do my own form work. I, I go over my forms. Um, I try to look at where the forms came from. You know, how did, how did, uh, you know, if this was an originally, originally a Japanese form or an Okinawan form, how did they do it? Mm. You know, how did it evolve to how we're doing it? Because I, I don't believe there's any really right way. It's just the way you were taught. You just do it the way you were taught. Um, so, but I, I, I want to know three, four different ways to do it. So I feel like I can speak intelligently about it. And then when you go to do Bunkai, you go to, to break it apart, you have a different, you have a little bit, um, there's there's more spices in the, in the soup, so to speak. Oh, yeah. It just makes it a little bit more, um, a little more savory. You get you get to speak a little bit more from different perspectives, and I think that's valuable because not everybody. Right, it also enables you to develop different languages because everybody understands English differently. You know? mm -hmm. you, if you've taught, you know, you could say the same thing to thirty kids, and one kid will get it, and the rest of them will look at you like here, you know. And then you have to change how you say it, and what you say, and when you say it, and, you know. Now. With your, your background in other arts, you came into Tong Sudo with some understanding. That, in my experience, is an asset and a liability. You have an understanding of how to do some things, but sometimes, you know, whether it's a form that's painfully similar but not the same, or you know, making small modifications to stances or to punch rotation or whatever it might be, it can become frustrating. Did you have any elements like that where you had to unlearn or, or you know, co-locate in your brain certain things? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's always that. There's, there's, you know, it's, I, for me, it was when earlier on I would learn things, and I, I never really understood why. You know, I, I learned them because that's the way I was taught, and that's what I do. And if I couldn't, I got to the, you get to the point, it's, at some point you get to the point where if you can't explain why it's done, then you just, you're basically just repeating it, right? So early stage um, training is you, you copy your instructor, right? If you watch any group of students, they're going to kick the way their instructor kicks, or they're going to try to anyway. Um, so you just do that. And then at some point you start to understand why and, and, and then, you know, the kicks, the forms do you, you know, you, you kind of transcend the form and you get into this place where you, you're, you're, you're expressing the idea and, and then instead of just copying a technique. Um, so I think the trouble gets, people get into trouble when they lock into a technique, but they don't know why. They just do it because that's the way I was taught. So I, I quickly so that's the got right out. Way. That's the best way. That's that's the way. Well, that's the way it's been done for thousands of years. Well, you get right. back to your original comment. You know, that's the way everybody's doing it now. So that's just the way you do it. Um, it 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 it. it so it does re it require a certain amount of humility to be able to say, well, you know, maybe I should just change this. But I I love learning new things, even things that I already know. I, I like learning new perspectives of it. I want to know your perspective. So I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm a, I've, I've been an artist. I have a degree in art. And it, I discovered it when I was, you know, you, you're, at, you're at a museum. And my assignment was I had to pick up a, 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 a piece of abstract art and, and pick an aspect of it and, and draw it. Mm -hmm. And as I walked around this room, it was in the middle of the room, I saw everybody was looking at different things. And whatever they were drawing, I saw in every different perspective. So now this piece that I'm looking at has an entirely new 
view to me. I kind of see all those different perspectives or as many as I was able to witness. So that process then gets translated to the martial arts. When I hit later on, I was like, this is the way, why do you do it this way? Show me. I want to learn. I want to know. And then I want to experience it. I want to feel it. You know, and then I want to apply it. Well, you rotate your punch the moment of contact, before contact, after contact, you know, so let's experiment, let's play. So I'm very much an experimenter. I want to know, and so I'm not a fixed to any way you throw a punch. Do you turn it? Do you hit it? You know, do you come down on it? Do you, is it angled in, 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 in Jeet Kune Do? Is it, you know, an angle? Do you, I, I don't care. It, 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 for me, it comes down to, does it work? Will it work? So even when I teach my students, I'm like, that's a low, they call it low block. Okay, we'll call it low block. It's low block. And you're performing it like you're just copying. I said, now you got to make it work. You know, you got you to make pretend you're actually blocking something that's going to hurt you or you're in, in, intercepting something or damaging something that's going to hurt you. And until they get that concept, they're just copying. And then you start to see the expression of that technique when they start to make it work. So, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go off on too many tangents, but. Uh, oh, tangents are good. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, I enjoy exploration. Um, I enjoy speaking with people who want to explore. Mm-hmm. I also, I also at the same time enjoy people who don't want to explore that they're so affixed to what they, what they think is the best way to do it. I want to know, like, okay, show me because it's just a, it's to me, it's just an extension a little bit further down that path of mastery that they believe that they, that they, they firmly believe in. That's mm-hmm. fine. That's great. I want to experience that too. I don't have to adopt it. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to live my life like that. But there's some information in there that I that might be valuable to me. And then even if certainly it's for the sake of information, like just bring it. Like, you know, it's a beautiful thing. There's so much to learn. It's 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 endless. It's infinite. So you know, I don't, sure. I don't. I like personal boundaries, but I don't like personal boundaries. If that makes sense, you know, <laughs> as someone who who. <laughs> Is exactly the same in that respect. I fully understand. <laughs> well, they say my hypocrisy knows no bounds. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, um, as someone with some some formalized education in art, you know, one of the things that I've found myself saying time and again is, if you break down the term martial art, art is the noun, and I think quite often we we miss that that we focus on what mm-hmm. to me is the secondary element, the, the martial art, the fact that it's combative. So, if, if you Think about your formal education in art and, and the things that you learned and enjoyed. How does that inform or possibly alter the way you see, practice, teach martial arts? Does it do, or does it? Maybe it doesn't. No, it absolutely does. Uh, so I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in the concept of how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to teach that to my, I try to show those concepts to my kids and even though my, my kids, my students, even, even if they don't get it right away, at some point it's going to click with them. Um, so the way I see anything is that it, it enabled, it, it afforded me the opportunity to, or affords me the opportunity to develop m- multiple approaches to one concept, which then gives me multiple languages to speak to a, a, a student. So and once I learn how they digest the information, I can then teach them in a way that's more efficient. So you see a lot of a lot of students with confusion on their faces. They're just like, oh, what am I doing? I'm just going, like, okay, I'm going to do it. You know, you know, there's not as much near hunger until they until they show up because they want to be there, as opposed to mom dropping them off. So you you know, you, it, it, it 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 I think it's a, an asset to be able to understand different perspectives because then. You, it gives you flexibility. It gives you, you know, just like in any martial art, and every situation is different. It's a dynamic, ever changing. You never know what you're going to need to pull out uh, right. to defend yourself. So, you know, there's there's definitely something to say about, you know, the value in you know a fixed mindset. And then for me, uh, I, I I can't stay fixed. My mind just keeps asking too many questions. All right. It's just like, well, why? Where's the, what if this happens? So, you know, I'm like the little students. Like, well, what happens if someone does this? And what happens if someone does that? When you're trying to show it's like an, an, a tiny little aspect of the technique. Um, so there was definite value in that uh, artistic approach to um, how many different ways can I express or, or talk about, you know, the ro- rotating, the rotating motion, you know. Um, so, the, yeah, I think it was definitely it was an asset for me. 
Uh, I'm also very much into NLP and hypnosis and, and how the subconscious mind works. So I develop languages and, you know, and I think that's what just attributes to my ability to teach students and to reach certain students that just think differently than, than the rest of the students. You know? if, if I was to put a title on this episode, we don't do that, but if I was, uh, I, I would be thinking about words that are, quest- you know, involve the word question, you know, like something about question or asking, you know, because that, that's what seems to be a recurring theme here is you're, you're asking questions. And, and what we just heard, you're asking questions even of yourself. Mm-hmm. What I find for those who continue to question is that there are moments where you have to take a big step back that you receive an answer that makes you go, oh, I've been doing that wrong, or that doesn't line up with this other thing that I believe. And you're, you're smiling. There's a little bit of a chuckle there. So I suspect mm-hmm. you're, I'm, I'm right that you've had at least one of those, but mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you might, even though I suspect as they've been for me, for you, they're probably quite personal. Would you mind telling us about one of those? Well, some, what an experience they may have had where I had to take a step back and, and get blown um, away. Let, let's, let's call it, let's call it um, either an epiphany or, mm-hmm. You know, your your world was rattled a little bit in the martial arts world. Yeah, yeah. Um, for example, I've had a couple of them in transitioning instructors. As they said, okay, well, you're doing this. Why are you doing this this way? And you know, early on in my martial arts career, it might have been, well, that's what I was taught. Mm-hmm. More recently, it's been, well, because of you know this, that, or the other. You know, I generally have an answer okay, we'll try it this way. And I go, mm-hmm. oh, this way makes more sense even for me because of, right. and, and such a big realization that it makes me go back and work through techniques and forms and my language mm-hmm. within the martial arts. It's, it's almost like realizing you were spelling certain fundamental words wrong. Mm-hmm. And now that you know how to spell them properly or more accurately to yourself, you're going back through your, all your diaries and saying, I've got to change all this. I've got to, I've got mm-hmm. to spell check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I follow you. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because you, you, you use the word, try, try this. Um, and I'm the try it on guy. Like I, I, my philosophy in life is try it on. Mm. As a matter of fact, I have a, a blog that I started years ago and I haven't really been doing much with it. And I plan on doing some more later. Let's try it on, you know? Because I don't know what's going to work for you. You don't know what's going to work for you. But if I have an opportunity to show you three or four different ways that something could be done, as a more seasoned martial artist, I think it is better. As As a student, it just gets really confusing. So you show them one way, you let them develop a sense of confidence with what they're doing. You have them apply it. And when they struggle with the application of it, there's your opportunity for an aha moment for them. Right, so that you could then it becomes a more better teaching. So I've had plenty of aha moments, uh, especially when I hooked up with my instructor, you know, Lewis Marvel, because he, you know, you know this guy was the, 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 one of the best martial arts I've ever had the privilege of working with, and he would just show me things and talk to me about things that they would do in Tang Sudo and in forms and in breaking down those forms that I had no concept, like there was no place in my mind, never thought of it. I never thought that this is what this could be. And that kind of broke another level of wax covering my my martial arts, what I thought I knew, right? So, you know, you break that seal and then you have a whole new world of, of it. Now, now I started questioning everything. I started questioning every single technique that I've ever learned. What could be a hidden meaning in this? What could be a hidden meaning in that? And that became now my area of exploration and, you know, the, Indiana Jones is my theme song in my head. You know, so I want to learn. Show me. I want to. Dis- I want to discover as much as I can. <clears throat> and then once I do, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to be able to play with it. Um, you know, and adopt what what is, is in alignment with your philosophy and with your values. And you know, you kind of dis- not, not want to say discard what doesn't work, but understand that it has a place for someone somewhere. Maybe not for you in this moment, but. You know, as you get older, things change. You know, those high kicks to the head don't count as much when you're 56. You know, when you're when you get older, so you you better learn some hands. You know, so 
you know, there's there's been plenty of aha moments growing on. I kind of look forward. I never know when they're going to show up, but I'm always open to them. I'm always looking for the next, you know, that's why I want to learn from as many people as I can. I want to learn different styles with different approaches, even if it's solid or fixed, because there's, uh, I see, I think there's value in it, you know, and, uh, for me anyway. Have you ever felt yourself being resistant to that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, but most of it's a, a personal resistance to the instructor and not necessarily to the material. Oh. And it's hard to translate the two because if you don't, if you think you're the instructor that, you know, not, these are instructors that I'm going to the seminars and things mm-hmm. like that. And I'll meet somebody and they're, you know, you, so you have someone that's very, very, um, and it's an interesting concept of cocky and confident, you know, uh, you know, people appear cocky if they exhibit a level of confidence you're not familiar with. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean they're cocky. It just means that they're that confident. So, um, you know, I keep reminding myself that it's not, you know, but some of them are very, um, uh, uh, I can't even think of the word that, that, cause I don't even go into that area anymore, but they're so fixed in their, in, in what they know that it's their way or the highway. And, and to me, that's just, to me, I find a little bit abrasive. It's like, well, okay, let's just show me. Uh, so I, once I get past that, then I'm a little more, open to the information that comes from them. Mm. So my resistance is normally with the presenter and not necessarily the, what the material is. Because I love the material. It's, it's but just it can be hard to separate that. Right? Yes. I, I suspect, you know, you've had enough instructors. You've had probably at least one. <clears throat> I, I've had several, um, including people that I went to train with for, you know, regularly, that I, I just didn't like them. I didn't yeah. like them as it's a person. Just, and, and, just, there was something about them that rubbed me the wrong way. And it was, it was an interesting challenge to remain open enough to learn what they had to teach me. E- even if it wasn't a lot, everybody's got something to teach. I think we all understand that. Even if what we're learning from someone is how not to do something, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like a first day white belt can teach you a lot about how the body moves that you didn't expect. And also, um, how terrible you are at teaching certain techniques. You know, why are you, why, how did you fall down? We were punching. Well, you told me to turn. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't tell you. Okay. You're right. You're right. It's on me. And that, that resistance, that, that ability to separate, you know, here's the yeah. person versus the body of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's such an interesting challenge that so few of us, really explore because who wants to spend time with people we we don't like yeah so i had an interesting experience years ago <clears throat> once i moved out to where i live now I, I, I again i was so hungry and i needed to feed my soul so i found someone close by that was teaching kali right? hmm. and i, I nice. always wanted to learn the stick fighting I always wanted to learn it so i went there and i paid for the month and i spent the first class with this guy and um the way he was teaching and what things that he were saying just really at the time totally rubbed me the wrong way. This was prior to, um, prior to Tang Sudo. So it was after Taekwondo, I was very much a Taekwondo stylist and I was learning all these other things. And I finally got, I said, Oh, there's a school nearby. It's 15 minutes away. It's great. And the way he was talking, I, I never went back. I just sat aside. Can, can you back. say more? So it, he would say, you know, they would say things like, uh, well, all you need is this. And he would hold a stick in his hand. You don't need to do all those knuckle push-ups like in Taekwondo and all those high kicks. And he was just like really knocking the style. And he had a room full of people I knew were Taekwondo stars. I could watch by the way they stretch. And when I talked to a few of them, they were like Taekwondo, 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 right? So I'm thinking that's not really necessary for you to knock the style. Just show me what, what, how, just show me, show me what's good about the stick, you know, show me about what's good about your, the style and, and I'll learn it. But that really kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And, I, and so you talk about like re, any regrets. That was like one regret that I had. And I don't look at it as a regret anymore. I just look at it as a lesson. It was then I changed once I realized it. I had an opportunity that whole month to learn something from this guy, even though he had this you know, this arrogant perspective about his style. So I lost out because of that limitation that I had, right? So I didn't like the abrasiveness. I didn't like the arrogance. So I was like, I'm not going to, I don't want to learn from this guy. But the truth is I could have learned a great deal. I could have learned a lot, you know, had I just 
been a little, you know, had I just put that aside, you know, we talked about that earlier, you know, putting aside, it's hard to put aside. And I think once you realize, once I realized that, I was able to then start putting it aside because I realized like I, I really could have learned something in that month and time's going to go by. You're never going to get it back. So, you know, so I don't care now. At this point, I don't really care if you're arrogant, if you're, if you want to be, if you want to tell me that this is the best way, only way in the world to do something. Okay. You know, let's go. I'm going to learn. You know, you I, know get to it, do, I get to do what I want with that information. You know, what the, it's my space, my head space. It's my style. It's my path. And, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Those people that you don't like, I've come to learn that the people that, that, that are not, you know, in alignment with your ideals and your, and your values, you could learn something from, you know? So, and it's like outside your comfort zone, all right, go there because that's where you're going to probably learn something really valuable. Um, and it's just, it's interesting how it kind of flips around, you know, everybody avoids the uncomfortable and uh, at some point in your life, you start going towards the uncomfortable because you know there's value in it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's interesting the way you're painting this picture of this, this instructor teaching Kali. If there were that many Taekwondo students in the class, it makes me wonder, was he, was he arrogant or was he afraid? Was he nervous that all these people had this body of knowledge that he didn't and he didn't want to look foolish? Yeah, I, I I've I you've uh, had question. an experience that I that I've had in that you start training with someone who knows you have prior experience and it mm-hmm. makes likely experiences where it makes them nervous. You can tell that they're afraid that you know things they don't. It's easy when you have somebody walk in with no training. It's really hard to look foolish in front of them. You can make up anything, you can say anything, <laughs> and, and if you true? say it confidently, they true. will believe you. And that is why, sadly, there are schools who will not teach people who have prior knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they're, they're rare, but they do exist. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And yet, I've been on the other side. I've taught people who have tremendous amounts of knowledge. I've taught people, I've taught my own instructors. Talk about nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know what they call that imposter syndrome, where you think what you know isn't enough, or, you know, and it happens all the time. And then I think you need to go through it as, as an instructor. And I think it, it's just an opportunity to practice a little humility. Mm. Um, so I have, I, I meet with other stylists. Uh, I have friends who are in Gojiru. I have friends who do the, the Okinawan styles. And I love the style. I've studied Okinawan Shore and Ru for two and a half years. I love the, I love the philosophy. I love the work. Um, I can't speak that intelligently about it when I'm around full of, you know, fourth and fifth and, you know, Hanchi, you know, can't, can't, you know, I'm not teaching them anything, but uh, at that level though, I think they all have the same mentality too, is that, you know, this is what, this is where they're at and, and they still learn from their students. Uh, they might learn technique from their students, but they learn different things. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's tough to, to, to teach uh, other, other, other styles. There is a certain level of apprehension and maybe that was the case for him. Maybe, maybe so. Um, and you know, my lesson in that was, you know, ignore it and and, and, and go for you know what's in the bowl. You know, reach in and, yeah. and grab what you can and assimilate what you can and you know, stay humble. Now you've mentioned a couple of times you've stepped into this role as Tung Sudo instructor, but prior to that, you hadn't talked about being an instructor. So was this really your first experience? Sharing no, that knowledge I, back I, with students. Oh, I studied tai, uh, tai Chi for a long time, so I, I started instructing Tai Chi. Okay, I started doing my own classes in South Philadelphia, and um, you know, for as long as I could, you know, for as long as I had a space available, mm-hmm. I still practiced on my own. So I had some teaching um, experience uh, prior to teaching Tang Sudo, um, and other things too. I mean, I do many, mm-hmm. many things. So even. You know, I, I just love explaining and sharing what, what my knowledge with someone who wants to learn. So whether it's fixing a carburetor or, you know, building a wall or painting or, you know, whatever it is, um, I enjoy that dialogue, that interaction. Um, so the, the, the martial arts just, just fell into place. It fell into my lap. I had no plans for it. It's just the way it showed up for me in my path. And I just kind of went with it there. Could it have gone any differently? When you look no, back uh, in hindsight? You know, I, I didn't. You know, the, 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 the few times that I did intervene, I regretted. 
Mm. You know, I kind of released the regret, but I, I, I learned, it's like, okay, you know, the resistance is, resistance is resistance. So um, I think it's something you learn from. You know, just like in the martial arts, when you put hands on somebody, when you get hands, you learn. You get to learn with their resistance, what their intentions are. You get to read it, and you get to work with it, and play with it, and understand it, and you know, and then use it to your to your benefit. You sure. know, so so it's much like how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, the martial arts I looked at is like I said before, it's a it's a it's a uh, a, a comprehensive mm -hmm. path to self mastery. You know, from yeah. my my perspective. Let, let's let's pretend that for some reason I'm asking you for contact information for a few of your students, and I'm going to ask them about you. Hmm. You know, have kind of like mini interviews with each of them about you. What would you hope they would be saying? Um, I've only had a few students come back to me over time that have thanked me for some of the stuff that I taught them. And, and, and the, some of the stuff that, I, that they learned, let's just say what they learned, not necessarily what I taught them, um, for them at, the, at that particular time in their lives were, was extremely valuable. And that to me was heartwarming. That to me was like the reason why I do what I do, I teach. You know, uh, not just because I'm a junkie, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so, you know, I would hope that you know, my students would say that um, they learned a lot more about, they learned more about themselves, um, that they learned that there are no real limitations other than the ones you put on yourself, and that uh, every experience you have is an opportunity to learn more about yourself, the world, you know, and, and your ability to create your life as you go, you know, so um, it's really not necessarily have to do with martial arts, but but those inherent values that you get that not too many people talk about yeah you know people talk about discipline and confidence and you know all the all the advertising language that they use for your school but you know it's so much deeper than that i think so i would hope that my students you know develop a stronger sense of self that they can you know that they realize that you know anything that they face they can handle you know whatever it is so that's really what it comes down to for me uh you mentioned South Philly. Is that where you are still? No, I, I'm area? actually out in Delaware County. Okay. Uh, right outside of Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, but I grew up in South Philadelphia. So. Okay. If, if people want to get a hold of you, is there a website, social media, anything like that we can well, I, um, give to I them? Took a, I took a few, a few months off of teaching from, uh, I, I teach at Level Up Black Belt Academy in Newtown okay. Square. Um, I'm part of the Junsa Tang Sudo Federation. Uh, was started by like Grandmaster uh, uh, Lewis Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, that federation, interestingly enough, is still growing. Mm -hmm. Schools are still joining up with the federation, and it's all, it's a very interesting thing that's happening because they're basically governing themselves. They're all working with each other to do, you know who's volunteering to do certificates, who's doing logo, who's doing this, and, and, and it's really just an amazing thing to watch these martial artists come together mm. and wanting to develop a sense of community for themselves. Beautiful, beautiful. I love thing it. I love that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just amazing. Really sit back. And, this is the most amazing thing. This is how it should be. Uh, how, right. Uh, this is not one person saying this is how it's going to be. It's everyone saying, I like that. I like that. Let's try it. Run with it. Let's see again. And we'll try it on guy, you know, try it on. If it works a beautiful thing, you know, so beautiful things happen when people come together, as they say. Um, so yeah, I, I teach at level up black belt Academy. I do, uh, I was doing prior to COVID two self defense classes a year at the Haverford uh, Community Environmental Center. It's called the, the Crack uh, Community Recreation and Environmental Center in Haverford Township. Um, I, I'll teach with the local library. I'll do self defense classes for high school students uh, a couple times a year. If, you know, this was all prior to COVID. Things have changed since then. We're getting back. We're starting to get back into that now. It, it sounds um, like to, to paraphrase a George Carlin piece that less than five percent are are going to get. If there's a gym, you'll be there. That's what I'm hearing. If there's a place for you to teach, you'll teach. Yeah, um, I, I'm actually honored when someone asks me to teach. Yeah. So if someone says, you know, I hear you teach martial arts and, you know, we had, my, my wife is an avid runner. She runs with a local running group here. And some, a, a woman who was out at 530 in the morning had an incident 
And uh, it wasn't a, a terribly bad incident, but it was enough that scared her. Um, and for me, that's enough. Yep. And they said, would you be interested in putting that sense of basketball? I said, let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's get it right now. I'm available. You let me know when you want to meet up and we'll do it. Find me a place. We'll show up and we'll do it. Yep. <clears throat> Couldn't get everybody together. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to teach more of the self-defense class at Level Up for a few weeks while they're on vacation. So you're welcome to come while I'm teaching and I'll, I'll go over some of the stuff that I talk about in my self-defense program. Um, so, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm on Facebook, Angela Matei, you know, Angelo T. Matei. And uh, I teach at Level Up Black Belt Academy, so they could they could reach out to that school if they wanted to. They can find you. Uh, You're not hiding. That's what I'm hearing. I'm not. I'm not hiding. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a recluse. Uh, I like to be out there. I, you know, I like teaching. I like teaching adults um, because the, the the language is there's mm. a greater vocabulary, you know, than than with children. But I like teaching kids too. Got it. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm around. Awesome. And. Uh, I'm still very much into it. Still looking for the next seminar. I have my Hawk Hockheim t-shirt on because, you know, I, I love, love what the guy does. He travels the country and uh, even if it's one day, I'll go there and, you know, get to meet some great people and, and people are just as hungry as I am. And that's a beautiful thing too. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, this, this takes us more or less to the end. So what do you, what do you want to tell the audience? You know, how, how do you want to leave this with them? So for, uh, I don't know, something that I've learned, I use this phrase all the time with, with, um, with students. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's just kind of a joke because I'm, I'm Italian and we like food and we like to feed people, right? So sometimes against their will, I've been told. <laughs> well, this is where the phrase comes from, right? So I say hungry students are going to eat and you're either going to eat or you're going to leave with a dirty shirt because you're going to get fed when you come to the class. So the hungry students will gobble it up, they'll eat, they'll leave full, they'll digest, they'll come back wanting more. And the kids that really don't want to be there, you're going to get fed too. But you're just going to wear most of it on your shirt. Right? So, you're going to leave. so it's just like imagine a bowl of pasta in front of you, and you're either going to eat it as I'm feeding you, or you're just, just going to fall all over you. So hungry students are always going to eat. you know. But either way, you're getting fed when you come into school. So from a student perspective, go in and eat as much as you can because, you know, those, those lessons don't come around too often. There's something beautiful in each and every lesson. The teachers are human beings. They have good days, bad days. They have stuff that they want to teach, stuff that they, that they forget or they're, or they're kind of like me where it's, uh, you have an idea, but you just kind of go with what the class brings, you know, who's there and, and uh, you kind of go with the flow. Uh, so for students that, um, and teachers, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it comes down to, I think, as a teacher, uh, I'm by no means an, an expert teacher, but uh, you know, I've been teaching long enough and, I, and it is a passion of mine. So it's like, you know, uh, again, you're, you're the one who's feeding, you know, um, and, and like you say, you can't, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, and you never know what a student is going to absorb. So for young teachers out there, you're just starting. You have this, you know, you're, you have this ideology around you and you want to teach certain things and you're excited and you're going by uh, processes and, and uh, you're trying to make it fun and get comfortable with the discomfort that a student might need to experience when they're learning something. Like don't, don't try to soften it up. Like that, that, that struggle is valuable. The struggle is really, really important. Um, and even for parents, let your kids struggle, let them cry, let them be upset. It's okay. Let them keep going. You know, we cry, crawl, walk, whatever, but just keep moving forward. So, um, I think a lot of that in, in the schools today, it says when we talk about everyone's doing it a certain way, you know, it's nice and it's fun. You know, you don't want little Jimmy to cry. Yeah. Yeah. But he's going to cry. Let him cry. It's okay. When you're done, let's go. Let's do it again until you figure it out. And there's, you're never going to get that anywhere else. Like that perfect, beautiful opportunity to teach something to someone through struggle, you know, learn how not to struggle. So, so to how you do anything is how you do everything. So. <laughs> if you couldn't tell, I had a great time talking to Angelo, just having such a conversation, right? Like if you guys have been around a while, you know, I love what I do. And I love what I do because the people that I get to talk to are the same but different each and every week. And that's a lot of fun. And, and here we are, another episode that is the same, 
because we're talking to another person who's really passionate about martial arts. And it's different because the journey is different. The experience is different. What comes out of it is different. And that's why I don't get bored doing what I do. And I'm sure that's why you don't get bored listening. Angela, thanks for coming on the show. Really, really had a lot of fun and hope we get to talk again. Hey, listeners, go check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Maybe sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. And hey, if you loved this episode, support us. Help us out. Help us grow. Help us cover our expenses. Pick something up at the store. Tell people about what's going on. Join the Patreon. Buy a book. You know, anything. Anything you're willing to do to help out. We appreciate it. You want me to come to your school? Teach a seminar? We can do that too. If you want to do that or you have feedback for the show, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at Whistlekick. You're going to find us everywhere. And that's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Thank you.